Hello and welcome to the Blue Waters webinar. I'm Scott Lathrop with the Blue Waters Project at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. Uh, we're pleased to have you join us today. Uh, Matt Turk will be talking about analysis and visualization with YT. Uh, he's with the UAUC School of Information Sciences and Australian Department and affiliated here with NCSA. So uh, I'm pleased to have uh, Matt join us today and Matt, take it away. Hi, so thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm gonna be presenting a, on a, a project that I've been working on called YT. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it and then depending on how, how time goes, uh, I'm going to see if we can, if we can do a little bit of uh, interactive demonstration toward the end. Uh, my understanding is that there uh, is a, a mechanism for asking questions, and so uh, if you if you would like to ask any questions, please do so. I have a tendency to uh, uh, I, have a, I have a tendency to get into a bit of a rhythm, so don't let that uh, dissuade you from asking questions if you have any. Um, so before I get too far in, I want to point out two URLs that you can go to. Uh, yt-project.org is our project homepage. Uh, on there, you will find information about the community that's, uh, that is around YT, as well as links to sample data sets, uh, tutorials, uh, some videos, and um, uh, on the very front page, in fact, there are some examples of, of quick ways to get started with YT and how to use it. Um, there are also uh, uh, links on how to install it and, and so on and so forth. So that's where all of the uh, development can be found. Um, Hub.yt is where our sample data sets are stored. We have both uh, sample data sets and then also a couple uh, reasonably larger data sets uh, that can be acted on. Uh, in general, we, we run a notebook server uh, that, that allows uh, authenticated access, but uh, right now that's, that happens to be down. So I want to start out by uh, giving a little bit of the, the uh, thought process behind how YT has been architectured. So, when we're dealing with data, oftentimes we think about data uh, living at a couple different levels. At the, the lowest level, uh, we think about the way that data is stored in terms of the bits. So you've got bits on disk that correspond to uh, you know, information, uh, and then decoding those bits uh, is, is a non-negligible task in, in many situations. And in fact, dealing with the data that YT was originally written to, to deal with, uh, uh, decoding the bits in order to to uh, get information out was a a process that uh, that required a considerable amount of, of uh, unification across different simulation platforms and so on. The next level up, we can think about uh, data uh, as being a layer of representation. So in this case, where we've translated from bits, uh, we've now translated those into uh, arrays, for instance, that correspond to physical quantities or non-physical quantities in, in some type of a system, uh, but that at some point, or, but at this point, still don't actually have physical meaning associated with them. And then so finally, at the very topmost level of representation, we can think about the way that data is represented in terms of the model that it represents. So my own work uh, is in the formation of the first stars and galaxies in the universe. And so the data uh, in my case is stored as bits on disk uh, that are scattered across different files. Uh, they're actually stored in HDF5, so some of the aspects of decoding from bits are, are taken care of by that. Um, these are then translated into Eulerian grids that uh, uh, cover the tessellate the entire domain and so that would be the data and then at the topmost level uh, from from my own work the the model would represent something like a star being formed or a, a gaseous cloud collapsing so yt is the project that i'm going to uh, chat about today uh, it's a project designed for volumetric analysis and visualization it's part of the the num focus uh, fiscally sponsored projects um, it's about 11 years old, uh, and we've been we've been working on it. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's become a, a community-supported uh, project that uh, has drawn people from a number of different disciplines. Originally, it was uh, created to deal with astronomy data, as that's the the data that that uh, you know I come from. But there are uh, scientists from other domains that we are actively engaging with, trying to to make it more accessible for them. 
sort of as a, uh, a side note, there is a, a related project uh, called Waitini, uh, which is uh, led by Jill Naiman, A.J. Christensen, and Kalina Borkevich. Uh, you can find information about that at waitini.com. And this is a mechanism for uh, uh, connecting YT to the rendering system Houdini. Uh, so it, it, it's both a funny portmanteau and also a meaningful uh, name in that sense. <laughs> So YT is a Python-based project. Um, when I say Python-based, I mean that the primary interface that individuals will have to it is through Python. Um, and actually, this is, this is uh, there's a little bit out of date here. We've removed all of our raw C code and replaced it with Cython. Cython is a Python-like uh, dialect that compiles down to, to C. Uh, and this enables uh, us to take advantage of, of C and pointer level access uh, while at the same time interfacing with Python's object model. So we, the primary interface is in uh, Python. There are a couple public APIs in Cython, but for the most part, individuals will interact with it using, using Python, even though it utilizes Cython for speed. Uh, it's community developed. Uh, we're part of the NumFocus uh, uh, umbrella organization. Uh, we operate under a code of conduct uh, based on the Python Software Foundation's code of conduct. Uh, we have a built-in governance structure um, uh, a bit over 100 contributors. I think we're around 125 contributors to the code base. Um, the primary applications of it are uh, volumetric and non-spatial data. So for instance, this would be uh, data that can be organized by a de facto or de jure metric, some system where you can describe a, a distance measurement between different points of data, whether or not that distance measurement is actually a spatial distance metric. Uh, it's been used, uh, this, is, this is actually a little out of data, it's been used in, in about 400 papers. Um, some of the types of data that, that YT natively uh, represent, or can represent and analyze include uh, things like uh, grids and Eulerian grids. Um, so for instance, adaptive mesh refinement data, unigrid data, uh, particles or discrete data points. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit toward the end about some of the different ways that we, we manage and deal with particle data. Uh, we have native support for octree data structures, and uh, as of about a, a year or two ago, uh, we now have support for unstructured meshes, including uh, second order unstructured meshes. So one of the, the things about YT that I'm particularly pleased about is that, uh, that I'm particularly proud of is uh, that, that through the, the efforts of the community, um, We've, we've added in support for arbitrary geometric representations. And so what I mean by that is that we can have logically organized data on disk. So for instance, data might be logically organized in a, in a uh, Cartesian mesh, uh, but then uh, that can be represented in memory as uh, some sort of arbitrary geometry. So for instance, you might store uh, a logical mesh uh, and then represent it as some sort of a distorted spherical, uh, a distorted or spherical uh, arrangement. The main idea behind YT, however, is to minimize the time to inquiry. And so I'm going to talk about what I mean by that uh, right now. So we think about uh, the different ways that we interface with data, you know, in, in the, the layers of representation that I noted earlier. But we can also think about these in a more horizontal system. So at the very first stage, we ingest data. Uh, and so that would be reading data off of disk. Uh, then a, the, the next phase is we represent that data. So this is loading it in as NumPy arrays. We conduct analysis on it. Uh, so we are now you know, processing it and generating derived quantities from it or derived uh, arrays from it. And then out of all of this, we build out visualizations. And so I want to emphasize that here visualization and analysis are related. But uh, for the, the purposes of, of this talk, I'm going to uh, make somewhat of an, art, uh, an artificial distinction between the two in the sense that uh, the visualization tools are a natural outgr outgrowing of the analysis tools that we build into YT. And then, uh, you know, nicely on top of this, uh, we build this, this layer of community. And this is a, a bit of a cartoon diagram, you know, and it's a little glib to say that we do community across the top. But in many ways, YT is a, a bottom-up organization, a bottom-up code that uh, we, we do you know, growth through the community. And to emphasize that, I want to note that uh, many of the individuals that are, are considered project members uh, are in fact uh, volunteers and graduate students and postdocs from a number of different institutions that uh, contribute to drive their own scientific goals forward. 
So getting back to the mindset behind how we think about data, we can think about data as, as uh, you know, big data. Off here to the side, you'll see that it's out of the frame. Uh, that's, that's supposed to be funny. Uh, however, since there aren't very many people in the room with me, I'm, I'm not getting a whole lot of uh, positive reinforcement on my, my little joke. Um, and then the idea is that YT is supposed to act as a boundary object, a contract between uh, the individual researcher and the data. And so what I mean specifically by that is that it presents an API in order to abstract out the mechanisms by which one might uh, uh, interact with data. So let's start by thinking about some simulation. Right? We have some simulation data, and maybe this was run on blue waters, maybe it's a simulation of uh, whole Earth seismology, or maybe it's a simulation of a galaxy formation, or maybe it's a, a simulation of a nuclear reactor. Uh, and then, you know, we want to get back to this notion of the three layers of representation. So as a brief digression, uh, sometimes we'll see simulations that are uh, organized in a rectilinear structure. So we've got, you know, some sort of Cartesian mesh and, and maybe uh, we're solving for fluid flow across the boundaries of, of the cells. And if this were an, adapt an adaptive mesh refinement simulation, in fact, occasionally we will identify some areas as being interesting. You can tell the interesting area here because it's the orangish pink one. Uh, and then the rest of it is very boring. Um, in an adaptive mesh refinement simulation, for instance, uh, we would then uh, add in a higher level of refinement here. Uh, and so we've got multiple different levels of resolution that coexist at the same, the same uh, time and in the same spatial region. Excuse me. So an alternate method of representing this would be, for instance, through particles, where you have a number of different attributes associated with each particle. Uh, in some cases, these particles will represent fixed uh, points. In others, they will represent sort of smeared out points, uh, depending on how it's, it's represented. But regardless, uh, you know, ultimately what you want is you want to have some sort of uh, image of what uh, things look like, or uh, whether that image is something that you can look at with your eyes or whether it's a conceptual image. So with these simulations, uh, sometimes we generate things like this. Uh, this is a uh, horrifying creature from the deep. Uh, uh, that's not true. It's actually a star-forming cloud in uh, the early universe, and this is actually from one of my, my simulations. Um, but while it looks kind of cool and interesting with these different features that are being drawn out of it, uh, the way this is being stored on disk is, is a bit more complicated in the sense that we have a number of different grids that overlap at points, that uh, represent the same uh, spatial region, that have different units, that maybe are at different, uh, different times, uh, but that certainly uh, are a little bit annoying to deal with. Uh, and in fact, when we look at this from the perspective of the resolution, you can see that all the way from coarse to fine, we've got lots and lots of different, uh, different sizes of elements that are, that are ongoing here. So we can read in data from a bunch of different uh, simulation codes and then generate fixed representations of it. Uh, so for instance, uh, these are some of the simulation codes that we can read in from. Um, so for instance, we can read in from uh, Octree data, like from ART or ART.io or RAMSES. Uh, we can read in from uh, grid data. So for instance, uh, one of the codes that I work on, uh, ENZO for instance, uh, Flash, uh, Pluto, Maestro, and so on. Uh, and we can read in from particle data, so uh, these may be either n-body or SPH codes. And then finally, we have some support for unstructured mesh, such as generated by uh, Exodus 2 or, or in the Moab data format. So returning to this notion of the simulation and how we want to access it. So if you imagine that we have this simulation and we want to do some type of analysis or some type of a visualization on it, we can start to think about, first we need to be able to select the data that we are interested in. So conducting some type of a selection operation on that data, and then uh, recognizing that that selected region is represented by some type of, of data collected from some backing store. So this is the interface here between the, the bit and the data. So if we think about this, this is, is where we start to identify what needs to be read off disk, transformed into different arrays that have some type of a spatial extent, and so on and so forth. So we make accessible low-level operations. So for instance, this would be taking a, a large opaque data set, turning it into a bunch of smaller chunks that can be operated on. Uh, so this works nicely for, for operations that uh, conduct a, a reduction. So as an example, this might be for n-dimensional histograms or for uh, uh, generating uh, spatial projections where you, you integrate along some dimension and do dimensionality reduction in that way. Uh, and 
one of the fun things about this is that oftentimes these data chunks will be of different sizes, and so these can also be uh, uh, load balanced across MPI tasks as well. And so if you want to do manual operations on individual data chunks, that is accessible. But for any of the operations that YT does, it, uh, uh, such as n-dimensional histogramming, projections, uh, some other dimensionality operations, uh, slices, and so on and so forth, uh, it actually knows how to uh, process that data in such a way as to load balance it uh, across MPI tasks without being, being instructed how to do that. For each of these low-level operations where we're operating on a chunk, uh, we can actually split that chunk up into even smaller chunks if necessary, uh, and those chunks can come from anywhere. And so the, way, the, the reason that, that I'm belaboring this is because uh, one of the, the problems that we aim to solve with YT is the abstraction of the notion between, uh, uh, the distinction between different representations of data and the physical meaning of that data. So if your data is represented as cells uh, which have some fixed space, particles which have some, you know, some uh, fuzzy boundary to them, or elements that uh, you know, require intracellular interpolation, you should still be able to ask the same questions about them in similar ways. So as we move up the, the layers of representation to the distinction between the model and the data itself, uh, we start to think about how the data is represented. So this is where uh, aspects like coordinate handling, so being able to manage the spatial extent of data as Cartesian or cylindrical or spherical, where perhaps you have it in, in geographic or tomographic coordinates, uh, as well as the association of symbolic units with data arrays. Um, I'm going to talk about the symbolic unit representation in, in a moment, but uh, I, I will note that, uh, that this is one of the things that I enjoy the most about, about using YT, and this is something that was contributed uh, by, uh, largely driven by uh, Nathan Goldbaum, John Zu Hone, Casey Stark, and a few others. Um, we also have the ability to generate derived fields, which, based on the data parallel nature that I, of, of the low-level operations that I described, allows us to generate derived fields only as necessary. Uh, and this can include uh, automatic calculation of dependencies and batching of I.O. Uh, transparently, as well as arithmetic operators and spatial operators. To talk about fields for a moment, uh, we think about fields in YT as being representations of state. So when we're evaluating a, a field, it has typically a name, some type of a unit associated with it, or if not units, then probably at least a dimensionality or a dimensionless uh, state, some type of a context in which that field is meaningful, and some type of a prescription for generating that field. From the, uh, from the context of, of simulations, oftentimes we are evolving primitive quantities, uh, which you know, for instance, you may be evolving the density, the internal energy, and, and so on and so forth. But it is from those primitive quantities that we can generate a much larger number of derived fields. So I like to think about this as being uh, derived fields as being this vast in potentia uh, set of mechanisms of representing state. So we, uh, we may not be able to, to say that you can read from disk, for instance, a kinetic energy, but if we have the mass and the velocity, we can compute it. And so that field is a, is a derived field that exists in potentia. So YT lets you define arithmetic operations to, uh, to represent fields. So uh, as an example, this is what uh, code in YT would look like to generate a derived field called energy. And you'll see that here we have uh, this decorator for at derived field. We specify the name. We specify the units that we want to come out of it. And so that serves two purposes. It serves the purpose of ensuring that uh, we have correctly defined our field, because if the dimensions do not match between that and what is produced by the function, uh, it, will, it will actually throw an error. And it's, it's something of a scolding error. It's, it's not one that, that I particularly like to get. Um, but the other, the other purpose is that if there is any ambiguity in what unit it should come out in, for instance, if uh, you, you are multiplying by mass units that do not automatically convert to ergs, it will convert them to that uh, on its way out. Then we write a, a uh, function just like we normally would in Python. So e is, sorry, I, I'm not used to click to touch to click. Um, e is 0 0.5 times our data's mass times our data's velocity magnitude squared. 
So I want to also note here that data mass is a derived function, as is velocity, or is a derived field, and velocity magnitude is a derived field. So YT implicitly calculates a directed acyclic graph that is specific to the set of primitive variables that are accept accessible inside every given simulation. We have the set of prescriptions for generating fields. Based on the fields that are accessible as primitive fields inside a given simulation, it computes a directed acyclic graph of dependencies, and then it reads those uh, in batches inside individual chunks in order to generate uh, each, each derived field. So if, for instance, you store density, you have a volume, and you have x, y, and z velocities, for each chunk as you are generating an energy field, it will read the necessary dependencies and then only store the resultant, uh, 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 it will only retain the resultant uh, set of requested fields at the end of the operation. So we also have the ability to generate spatial operations. So one simple example of this would be the divergence of the velocity. If we're storing uh, the divergent, if we're storing the velocity we're sto uh, along the x, y, and z axes, we can compute the divergence of the velocity by taking the partial derivative of each component along its direction. So YT, uh, with a little bit of, of finagling using slices, can generate uh, uh, derivatives that require uh, additional spatial cells. So for instance, here we're saying uh, the validator for this derived field is that we need a spatial field. So it needs to be organized in three dimensions. We need to have one additional ghost zone or one additional zone in every dimension so that we, we have a full kernel. And then inside, we generate our field by, by computing the divergence. Now, note here that uh, our f is going to be one less than our input data. This is because it's going to have two less in each dimension than our input data. And that's because we are using a stencil that is one cell bigger. We do this uh, in, in YT by doing cascading interpolation to generate ghost zones if ghost zones are not available on disk. So what that means is that we take our lowest level grids and then we do conservative interpolation uh, from each level necessary in order to generate a, a grid or a set of part or, uh, a, a grid that, that covers the necessary region. Uh, at present, this doesn't work for uh, particle cell or particle codes. However, uh, there is work being done that I'm going to talk about a little bit later that applies the uh, SPH formalism uh, to generate spatial derivatives uh, of SPH fields. Um, we do not yet have a, a mechanism for non-SPH uh, discrete fields. So on top of this are the mid-level operations. So we can think about things like uh, multiplying two arrays together. Uh, so for instance, though, we might have an array that is a distance, an array that is a frequency, and then we want to get out of that distance per second. Uh, YT does this by tracking symbolic uni uh, units across uh, simulations. So for instance, if it knows that a density is stored as grams per me uh, meter cubed, that becomes a SymPy object that is affiliated with, the, uh, with that array uh, and then is, is operated on as it's carried along. So the, the advantage of this is that we can utilize any of the uh, computer algebra system manipulation that is accessible through SymPy, um, but it also allows us to generate uh, uh, a formalism for, for having simulation or data specific units. So as an example, that means that if I am, if I am analyzing cosmological data, uh, I can manipulate it internally consistently uh, with my own choice of Hubble parameter or redshift, um, and then operate on it self-consistently with uh, data that has been generated with a different Hubble parameter or redshift. This allows us to, to track the units and generate things, but it also allows us to uh, aid in our construction of our, our dependency calculation uh, for generating fields. So we can also go the opposite direction and say, I would like a field that has, the, that has uh, this set of units. What would be necessary in order for me to be able to generate that? Now, from a pragmatic perspective, you know, if we have a simulation of a galaxy, uh, for instance, and this is a simulation of a galaxy, uh, what we can do is we can uh, identify the, the fields that are generated or that are stored on disk. And in this case, there are 43 primitive fields on disk. For this particular simulation, uh, while you are free to add your own derived fields and your own encyclopedia of derived fields, 
uh, at its base level, YT knows how to generate 363 different derived fields from this data, just looking at the mapping between what the data, uh, what the fields are called inside the data set to what YT recognizes as semantically meaningful data inside its internal ontology. Uh, there are 35 distinct units that are recognized in here, uh, and we can actually, uh, this is, uh, this is backwards. It's two point, there are roughly two and a half derived fields for every derived, uh, primitive field on disk. So now getting to the very highest level, we have high level operations where instead of regarding things as, as chunks of data, we regard them as uh, physically meaningful models. So for instance, instead of thinking about a, a, a chunk or set of chunks, uh, which sometimes come in different shapes and sizes or sometimes are split up over many different files, I can actually think about them as, for instance, stars. Um, this provides us the opportunity to generate thing, uh, to, to develop uh, imaging and volumetric tools. So doing uh, volumetric segmentation, uh, both in parallel and with irregular resolution data. Uh, pragmatically, what that means is being able to identify uh, ISO uh, topologically connected sets within irregularly spaced data and irregularly shaped data. Uh, we can do, uh, if, if topolo topologically connected sets is not really your thing, we can also do uh, marching cubes. Uh, ray tracing for both the purposes of radiative transfer and for volume rendering. Our principal ray tracing engine is a software ray tracer. However, we do have uh, recent developments into uh, hardware accelerated ray tracers that are, that are pretty exciting to me. And this also means that we can take an array and because we have information about its spatial extent, about the coordinate system that it respects, uh, about you know, any number of different, different things that, that correspond to physical meaning with it, uh, we can rasterize that data set and turn it into some type of an image. So here's an example of, of how we you know, do ray tracing across uh, data sets. We've got a ray, we walk it across our data sets, we accumulate. And this can both accumulate RGB values if you want to make a visualization, but we can also use this to accumulate uh, things like optical depth and, uh, and the emission and absorption from different, different systems. This is an image that I made from, my, uh, from one of my, my thesis uh, projects some time ago. And one of the reasons that I'm, I'm showing this is because I've chosen in this particular visualization to highlight ISO contours that reflect chemical information inside the calculation. So I know where the molecular hydrogen dissociation uh, begins to take hold and I've chosen to highlight that as an ISO contour. Uh, and, and I've associated a width with that that, uh, that is associated with the width in a given reaction rate. Uh, and I've also chosen to highlight background uh, values that correspond to other chemical reactions. And I can do this programmatically using the information that YT exposes from the data set. So we're, we're currently working on, on things like cloud tracking, so taking uh, connected sets in Eulerian meshes and tracking them across time where the connected sets might squish and change shape and so on, uh, but they still have some sort of, of uh, identifiable uh, region. And then, in fact, this is a, a different representation of, of a, a similar simulation where I've identified in the upper left an N -dimension, a two-dimensional histogram generated by YT and I can highlight specific ISO contours in order to emphasize the connection between the physical processes that are ongoing uh, inside the, the phase transition uh, between uh, molecular and atomic hydrogen and the topological uh, characteristics of the, of the cloud. So in terms of, of uh, new things that are going on, and in particular on Blue Waters, uh, we've been uh, lately working on development of what we call LibYT. Uh, typically, the, uh, the mechanism by which one would do detailed analysis, uh, and this is uh, and perhaps this is a little bit outmoded as I believe that there have been several presentations on in-situ analysis uh, recently in the Blue Waters webinars. Um, but typically, you know, one of the, the, uh, the, the ways that people often analyze data is by taking their simulation and writing out to disk either a full checkpoint or, you know, a, a big checkpoint or something like that. Uh, what we've been working on is we've been working on, uh, and in particular, uh, much of the credit for this goes to uh, Shi or Justin Shiv, uh, who has been working on this uh, with respect to the gamer code. Uh, so implementing LibYT, a pure C library that communicates over MPI communicators with an, a running analysis code so that you can have fire and forget analysis tasks that run asynchronously with the rest of the simulation. 
the, the stop, churn, and restart analysis is accessible through YT, but this allows us to, to do a bit of a more fire and forget and reduce our overhead. We've been working on development of higher order uh, 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 finite element analysis. So your typical first order analysis uh, allows you to to utilize, uh, for instance, you know, points at, at the different vertices of, of a a mesh uh, in order to to uh, to generate values inside that mesh. Um, oftentimes, uh, simulations will have second order or or higher methods uh, for for computing the internal representation of fields. Um, one method for analyzing and visualizing this is to use approximate second order, uh, where you, you subdivide the, tri the, the say, tetrahedra into smaller uh, first order objects. Uh, thanks to, to work by Andrew Myers and Alex Lindsay, uh, we've now been uh, able to avoid second order and uh, have a software volume renderer uh, that, that does uh, higher order uh, volume rendering uh, uh, and intracellular interpolation of finite element uh, values. Additionally, I want to note that in collaboration with the Gravity team at, uh, at TAC, we have been implementing interfaces between YT and Gravity. Uh, Gravity is a, a super cool uh, volume rendering system that, that does things like this uh, in a hardware accelerated fashion. So I had promised that I would talk about uh, some of the ways that we're working on discrete uh, particle uh, analysis. So there's a project ongoing called the Dimensioning. Uh, currently, it's being led by, by Nathan Goldbaum, uh, uh, but uh, uh, was originally started by Megan Lang. Uh, here at, uh, both, of, both of them are here at NCSA. Um, and what this is, is a uh, the, the reason that we call it the Dimensioning is because our first pass at analyzing discrete particle data sets was to construct a Morton ordered uh, octree around all of the particles inside inside the data set. And so what this meant was that for every particle, in order to construct this octree, we had to store a 64-bit integer uh, that, that corresponded to its, to its Morton index. What we're now doing is utilizing uh, compressed bitmap index technology. We are identifying uh, inside subchunks of particle data sets where the uh, data sets inter uh, where the data sets are represented in a Z order curve. This allows us to do uh, nested uh, bitmap indices. So we can have a coarse level index that says these are the different regions uh, in the bits that correspond to these different spatial regions. And then for regions where there are collisions between uh, different, different items, we add a second level. And so uh, this allows us to then from that generate a spatial tree that uh, enables fast indexing and querying. So what this might look like is if you imagine that blue is one region, red is another region, uh, you can identify which regions in space each of those data files or subsections of data files uh, interact with. And then anywhere that there is a collision at your course order, you simply add a level of refinement. Uh, one of the nice things uh, that we, we are able to do with this is that by utilizing the EWA uh, uh, library from uh, Dan Lemire, the Enhanced Word Aligned Hybrid uh, System for Compression, we can actually do logical operations without decompressing our, our bitmap uh, indices. And so what that means is that if we generate a selector, we can identify which bitmap uh, indexes it, indices it overlaps with. We can store compressed bitmap indices for all of our individual files, and then without having to uncompress either one, we can do logical operations to identify what needs to be read from disk in order to fill in a given spatial selector. So I'm going to take a step back and talk about things from the social perspective uh, very briefly. And I'm going to note uh, a little bit about our community. So our community is not the biggest. Uh, it's not the smallest. But uh, we are reasonably active. Uh, these numbers are slightly out of date. Uh, after we moved to python.org for our mailing lists, uh, we're, we're up around 400 people on the so-called users mailing list. And you know, in the, the low to mid hundreds uh, on the developers mailing list. Uh, the code uh, operates through a peer review system, so we have uh, standards for, for acceptance of code and for how to review code. Uh, we engage in active mentorship with new contributors, uh, and there's a continuous testing system. We're also, uh, this year, we are participating in the Google Summer of Code under the NumFocus umbrella. We're quite excited about this, um, and we've, we've gotten some, some interests. I want to take uh, one moment then to, or well, actually, I'm going to continue taking my moment uh, to dive into 
uh, community just to note that there are core values that we try to to uh, to to embed inside our our uh, technical and social infrastructures from the top to the bottom. Uh, and the first of these is how can we increase diversity? Uh, and we, we try to reflect this in the way that we attempt to lower barriers to entry, both real and perceived at all different levels, technical and social. How can we foster careers? Uh, and what we mean by that is really how can this code, which isn't finished and perhaps never will be finished, still foster the careers of the people that uh, want to contribute to it and want to participate? Um, how can we, we enable participation without uh, preventing you know, early stage researchers from, uh, from, from falling into, into traps of you know, getting into code development? Uh, and how can we lower barriers to entry technically and socially? And you know, again, this is the, what are the core values? I'm gonna skip a little bit here and talk about uh, one thing that I think is, is relevant to this audience, which is that uh, we don't like to think about uh, YT as a product. We like to think of it as a project. You know, in, in a product, you've got something that is delivered to users. Uh, and, and in a sense, uh, we like to think of it as a project, as a, a, an ongoing conversation that we have with the researchers that, that utilize it. And, and I think this is actually uh, evidenced by the fact that many of the people that develop it are researchers attempting to conduct their own, their own research. We like to think not of the thing, the product, but also you know, instead of, of the people that are using it. So this concludes the prepared portion of the webinar, or well, let's say the, uh, the, the uh, not, let's not say prepared, but let's say the slide-based proportion of the webinar. Uh, and I want to say thank you uh, for uh, you know, giving me this opportunity to, to share with you about this project. Um, here are some helpful links, uh, including my email address, um, the link to the, the main project, the link to my group here, and then I put up my personal website, but I can't see any, fees, any, any potential reason that anyone would be interested in visiting that. So um, I'm going to leave it there. And then I'm also, uh, I, have additional, I have an additional slide that, that I'm going to put up uh, when we get to the, the uh, semi-interactive portion. So, I'm going to take just a moment in case there are any questions, and there might not be. If you have questions, you can feel free to post them on the YouTube chat or on the Slack channel if you're involved, in, if you're connected with either. So feel free to post questions, and we'll make sure Matt gets them. So then I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to move on here. So there are two different ways that, uh, that well, there are three different ways that, that you can get YT if you want to follow along. We have a Docker image. Uh, so you can pull Docker, uh, you can, uh, Docker pulls our Theseus slash YT hub dash Jupyter, and then you can run it. You can also Conda install, and we suggest that you install from Conda Forge, the YT package. Uh, and if you, if you would like to go a more manual route, you can also go to yt-project.org and click on get YT. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to start up an interactive session. Yes. I'm going to use the Jupyter Notebook, which I, I believe has been recently presented in, uh, in, in a webinar or will be presented soon. And I'm going to, I will be making this large enough to be seen. And I'm going to show you a couple different things that you can do with YT. Uh, and in particular, the, the reason that I want to, to show these things is to identify a couple ways that uh, you can use YT to get at your data more quickly. So the very first thing that we do when we start using YT is we import YT. And so the, the next thing typically that people do is to load a data set. So we have, a couple, we have many different ways of loading data sets, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to just use the yt.load command. So inside the Jupyter Notebook, there are uh, you know, lots of, of fun tab completions. Um, I'm going to, uh, 
There we go. I'm going to load up a high-res isolated galaxy here. And so what happens when I do ds equals yt.load is I can specify any of the data formats that yt recognizes. In this particular case, it's an ENSO simulation, a high-res isolated galaxy. But we can also load up data from a number of different things. It will auto-recognize uh, data generated by Moab, by Gadget, by Art, basically anything that, uh, that, that YT can load. It has a mechanism for auto-recognizing. There are also methods for uh, loading data as a stream. So for instance, uh, we could do ds.load uniform grid, load unstructured mesh, uh, load particles, load octree, uh, and then I think there are a couple others. But for instance, with some, uh, load AMR grids, and we can, we can get help on each one of these things and we can see examples of how to load in data um, as well as uh, you know, detailed information about all the different parameters. Once we load in our data, however, the data sets mostly or completely behave the same. So we've loaded in this data uh, and now it's read in from disk all of our different parameters. Uh, Enzo in particular has a large number of parameters and so this is something like 400 some long. And it's also generated for us information about the data set itself. So if we look at something like ds.domainWidth, this is a derived attribute that looks at the size of the domain that's covered by the data and this is more meaningful for some types of simulations than others. And it returns that information to us in a YT array. A YT array is a subclass of a NumPy array that, uh, that, allow, that uh, provides a couple different uh, types of, of, uh, of operations to it. So for instance, we see that it's rep uh, the width here is one in code length, but we can also do uh, domain width in units and we can say in megaparsecs. We could do this in mile. So it's a lot of miles. Um, there are a number of units that are available. So if we look at yt.units, you can get an idea of some of the units that are available. Um, not all of these are, are length units. Uh, some of them are. Um, some of the more fun ones are things like earth mass and earth radius. Um, I seem to recall that we had, we had some joke ones in there like Hertz. I mean, Hertz, is, that's not a real unit, right? That's a rental car company. Um, uh, Jupiter mass. See. The, the jokes uh, go over even worse uh, on a webinar. Um, but we can do a number of different things. And so I want to, to point out something that I had, had alluded to before, which is that if I have a domain width and I want to do that in a unit that doesn't make sense, um, YT will scold me somewhat. You'll see unit conversion error. And it comes up and it actually tells me uh, unit dimensionalities do not match. Tried to convert between code length and G. Uh, so those, those don't match. One's dimension lengths, one's dimension mass. So once we have our data loaded in, what can we actually do with it? So implicitly, YT will construct an index of the data uh, as necessary. When that index is used, it will or when, when data is requested, it will use that index to, uh, to load only that which is requested into memory. We have a couple different uh, selector operations. So for instance, we can do a ds.region. So a ds.region is a, uh, a rectangular prism. It has a center, a left edge, and a right edge. The center here uh, is, in fact, used for, for things where you have an off-center uh, uh, rectangular prism. Um, we can do spheres, uh, which have a center and a radius. You know, things like ellipsoids uh, and, and so on and so forth. But we can also do uh, fast region selection based on uh, uh, using something called ds.r. So ds.r is a method for uh, quickly selecting regions that, are, that follow uh, uh, rectilinear coordinates. So for instance, if I do ds.r and using the Python slice notation, I just select everything, it creates for me a region, a rectangular region that covers the entire domain. If I were to do ds.r 0.1 to 0.9 and then everything along the other uh, re, uh, dimensions, you'll note that here our left edge in the, in the zeroth dimension is a little bit shy of, of, of 
the full uh, the width in the zero width dimension is a little bit shy of the full the full size. So we can also use uh, units to describe this. So for instance, if I wanted to uh, specify that I want to start at 0 0.1 megaparsecs and go to 0 0.9 megaparsecs and select everything along the y and the z axes, I can do that as well by using this tuple uh, uh, tuple value. But it's from this uh, region selection, which you'll note that uh, these have been very fast operations. It has not been reading any data from disk yet. Uh, it's when we have this region that we can do operations on it. So let's assign that to a variable like region. We can ask for things like what is the density inside that region. And it'll go out uh, here. It constructed our implicit index. The next time it won't have to do that. And it returns to us an array. So on that array, we could do, for instance, max, right? And it gives us our max. But we can also do this uh, if we want to, to uh, take advantage of our ability to conduct indexes by doing things on the region itself. So for instance, I can ask for the max density and it can uh, go out and lazily compute that. So instead of reading all of the data from disk uh, and then returning that to an array and then computing on that array, we can have it compute the max piecewise amongst the different chunks and then return to us just that maximum value. So this also allows us to do things like computing many, many different uh, values at once and only storing the necessary reduction uh, uh, coefficients in order to, uh, to continue on. So let's say if we wanted to do each one of these, we can ask for multiple different maxes. It'll read each one uh, individually and then return to us the, the final value. Although I think that, yeah, there we go. Um, it'll return to us only the final value from those. Uh, without having to track any information in between the individual chunks. We can do other fun things with this, like if we want to do argmax on something. So let's say that we want the argmax of density along temperature. What this does is it says along the axis of density, what is the maximum temperature value? Or what is the, sorry, along, what is the temperature value at the maximum value along the density axis, for instance? And you know this this can also be expanded. This can take a couple different things. So let's say that at our maximum density location, what's our maximum velocity, magnitude, what's our temperature, and and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'll take a question. I'm surprised we have. All right, That's a couple possible. questions have come in. Uh, one is, how do I run it on Visual Studio? On Visual Studio, that's an interesting question. Um, we do have a developer that uses Visual Studio code quite extensively. Uh, and I believe that as long as it's, uh, because Visual Studio code now integrates nicely with Anaconda, I believe that it should, uh, and because YT is available as a Conda package, if you install it into the same environment, it should be accessible there. Uh, but if it's not, uh, that's something that we would, we would be happy to, to hear about and, and work with you on getting working. Okay, another question. Could you discuss how to create visualizations with many large files in parallel? How about creating animations across cosmological time with many simulation snapshots in parallel? Sure. So let's, uh, let, me, let me start with where I'm at here. So I was talking about the, you know, the different operations that you can do on a data selector. Uh, so we've got this region data selector, and in fact here I'm going to make this region be the, the full data selector. So I can do region, uh, and for instance, one, one thing that I can do is I can say what is the maximum density along the axis of X. So what this will do is it will conduct a variable resolution projection along that axis. So let's say projection is region maximum along the density, or uh, density along the axis X. So now we have this and we can do, uh, we can plot it. And so this generates a visualization uh, where it's a variable resolution. You'll note that in this particular data set, there's a large background uh, value. So let's assign that to our plot variable. Now let's zoom in by, let's say a factor of 10. Let's see, we're a little bit off center, and in fact, we should probably be doing this along the, the z-axis. So instead, let's, let's go here. Projection is region. Uh, and you know what? Let's integrate uh, density along the z-axis. Uh, 
uh, and we can we can skip a step here and do plot is region dot integrate dot plot. Let's take a look at what plot looks like. So you see there's our, our galaxy. Let's go ahead and let's zoom way in. Uh, let's zoom in by 25. See the galaxy is a little bit off center. So what's happening here is if we if we look on the back end inside our YT sample data, this was inside high res galaxy, inside DD0044. This is actually already running across a, a 32 different files. It's pulling them in, operating on each one in succession, uh, just the data that's necessary. What happens if we run this in parallel, uh, what you can do is, is uh, if executed in parallel and at the top of a script you call YT enable parallelism, all of the operations that we have already seen will be op uh, conducted in parallel. Every single one of these operations will be done in, in data parallel mode. Uh, it will be split up across the number of MPI tasks that are, that are available. Uh, and then you're, you're, you can, uh, you, then you get the images back from that. So if you are, are in parallel, and, and right now I'm not, um, there is also the ability to do uh, yt.parallelobjects. So what parallel objects does is parallel objects is a parallel iterator. So for instance, if I had a, a simulation data set, I could iterate over all of the different objects inside that simulation. If I wanted to, I could specify the number of jobs. So if I wanted to assign more than one uh, MPI task to each, uh, to, to each simulation and have it generate sub-communicators inside MPI that, uh, that, that operated on subsets of the data, it would do that. We can iterate over that. So for, uh, let, me, let me actually generate a, a better example of that. So, one way of doing this, and I believe we have support for, for loading um, Enzo data and Gadget data and a couple others in this way, uh, but you can also uh, do this manually. So we can load up a glob. So now instead of a single data set, we have a data set series. We can do a parallel iteration over it. So iterate over the time series components in parallel. So in this one, we could do for data set in sim.piter. And then we could do my plot is ds.r. Let's just do everything, although you know we could also do a cutout or something like that. We could do an integration of density along the z-axis. And we can plot. And then we can do my plot.save. And so what this will do, oh, unknown axis equals none. Yep, I gotta specify that this is the axis. So now, were I running in parallel, each one of these jobs would be done by a different uh, MPI communicator. Uh, and if I had set the, the number of tasks inside the, the communicator to be greater than one, it would subdivide each one of these individual tasks. But this, uh, this particular script, and you'll note that here I've, I've done it on a, on a uh, I guess the, the term would be laughably small data set um, in order to get, to get results quickly. Uh, it, while I'm doing it on a small data set here, uh, this will auto-parallelize uh, on, on larger data sets. Sure. Okay, the next question. Is there any in development interactive interface to, for example, rotate or otherwise explore plots? Yes. Um, there is in development, and so <clears throat> I'm going to do something now that uh, I advise everyone everywhere never to do, which is to search YouTube for the video. Um, so I apologize. Uh, oh, the B movie lied to me. Anyway. Um, I'm going to, to show, uh, uh, let's just go to YouTube, volume render is Arthesius. These are some of our older videos. Um, so what are you searching for? I'm trying to find, uh, 
a video that, that a research scientist here generated. Here we go. So this is a video. I'm not going to, to attempt to show it, but this is a volume rendering uh, interface that we've been working on. So this is, uh, and, and actually there are a couple of visual artifacts in this that are no longer present. We do have a volume rendering, uh, an OpenGL native volume rendering uh, system for adaptive mesh refinement data. Um, we are working on extending that to SPH data. It does currently work with, um, with unstructured mesh, although not, uh, to my recollection, not to higher order unstructured mesh. Um, this entire system is built on uh, GLFW, which supports, uh, or GLFW and PyOpenGL. Uh, it supports off-screen rendering, and it's been instrumented with what's called the traitlets, inter, uh, the traitlets environment, or traitlets package. What that means is that uh, our first pass at this uh, required a native uh, OpenGL window. We are currently extending that to work inside JupyterLab using traitlets so that we can blast pixels that have been generated using off-screen rendering on GPU accelerated clusters back to a, a OpenGL accelerated 2D canvas inside the browser window. So the idea being that uh, right now you can do it on reasonably you know sized data sets uh, on a local machine and if you want to do X11 forwarding you can do that but we are close to being able to do that through uh, through direct access to a 2D canvas in a browser uh, from an OpenGL accelerator or GPU cluster or something like that. So yes, uh, it's in development. It has taken longer than I would like. Uh, and that's my fault. <laughs> One more? Sure. Do you have a master's degree in computer graphics related to YT? I do not. That was the easiest question yet. Maybe the question is, <laughs> how does one learn this? Or how, how does one get deeper into this? Oh, so that that is a, a fun question. We would absolutely love to, uh, you know, we try to be a very welcoming community. And, uh, you know, it one of the, the things that, that uh, I would really like uh, to, to come out of this would be if people were interested, if they uh, visited our Slack channel, uh, if they they stopped by uh, one of our, our workshops, and you know if 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 you'd like to to chat with any of us, you know that that would be amazing. Um, I want to point out that uh, there are some very active individuals in the YT community that uh, uh, that that I didn't call out by name, uh, but that I should have, including Nathan Goldbaum, Casper uh, Kavalik, uh, Hillary Egan, Britton Smith, Cameron Hummels, John Zuhone. Um, you know, there are, there are all these different people that, that really participate uh, and that are, are really fun to get to know uh, as well. If, if I can, I would like to show one, one final thing, um, which is that, you know, we can do these things like projections, but we can also do something like uh, region.profile. And so here we can specify that we want to do density versus temperature. And we can specify a weight field of, say, dent uh, cell mass, let's say. And we can plot that. Uh, yeah. Oops. Sorry about this. I forgot uh, that, that weekly referenced objects happen. Let's do this. Uh, I just have to re-execute this. Oh, I shouldn't have done this. I went for the stretch goal. So embarrassing. So we can do uh, n-dimensional plotting. Uh, or Well, it's easiest to do this with one and two dimensions. Uh, two-dimensional histograms. So you can do things like the average uh, temperature as a function of density. And then also, if you want, you can specify uh, multiple uh, coordinate systems, so density, temperature. And then uh, you can specify that you want to do the uh, velocity magnitude. And so in this case, it will generate a two-dimensional histogram. Uh, where along the x-axis you've got density, along the y-axis you've got temperature, and then the average velocity magnitude is plotted inside the, uh, inside the, the value. Now, if you wanted, you could also uh, change this so that it's, uh, it does, say, cell mass, 
uh, you know, and weight field equals none. And there are a whole bunch of different parameters that we can tweak here to change the resolution of, of the output uh, profile and so on and so forth. But here we can see a mass distribution. And you'll recall that in our one-dimensional profile, this is basically what it looked like uh, as well. And so in this way, we can do uh, a couple different uh, mechanisms for n-dimensional plotting. So that, that was the, the last thing I wanted to show. <laughs> So you mentioned workshops. How does one find out about them? Oh, that's when, a, and, when and where? That's a great question. We are planning to have another workshop uh, this fall, uh, uh, likely here at UIUC, but potentially somewhere else. Uh, they are announced on our on our users on, on the users mailing list, uh, and we we also do tweet about them. Um, we will be uh, in the future engaging better with uh, announcing these through uh, through groups like Exceed and Blue Waters and so on to make sure that information gets out. And uh, for these workshops, we, we also do our best to provide participant support costs, uh, particularly for early stage researchers or researchers that would be uh, other, otherwise unable to attend. OK, last call for questions before we uh, end the webinar. I see no more questions. So you, you have. Uh, the email address for Matt, and we will uh, let you all know when we have the uh, final uh, edited version of the uh, video recording available. So we encourage you to take advantage of that. And with that, then, uh, join me in thanking Matt for a great presentation today. <clears throat> uh, we welcome your suggestions for further topics, and we hope to see you again at the next webinar. Thank you.